St. Stephen's High School's Tractor Shed Theater presents Unexpected Beauty, a creative arts homage to Steve McCurry's photography exhibit, Hickory Museum Hi, of I'm Art. Lauren Pitt, and I chose to write a poem based on Steve McCurry's show in monks in training and men going to go behind me. The most real state is the state of nothing. Do not let this start frighten the fragile mind. From nothing comes the intransitly void mind. Nothingness contains the universe like a child's glass jar with the many dancing twinkles of light. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. If a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows him. If a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him, like a shadow that does not move. Thousands of candles can be lit by a single candle, and the life of that candle will not be shortened. Happiness does not decrease by being sh shaped. Anger will not disappear so long as thoughts of resentment are cherished in the mind. Anger will disappear just as soon as thoughts of resentment are forgotten. Hands pressed in symmetry, keeping the seven's final lights bright. Breathe, inhale the beauty of life and become one with it. Teach this simple truth to all. A kind heart, good words, and a life full of service are those things which renew humanity. Keep hearts unlatched minds sublime, and words affable. Beauty beyond measure cannot reach a higher state. Meditate, love purely, be quiet. Work with mastery. Like the moon, come out from behind the clouds. Shine. Namaste. Gomez and I'll be performing Red Boy, a spoken word piece based on this image in the point of view of an onlooker. Aapki sapota ke yeb shub kamnaye. When winter melts into spring, the warm color being speaks in volumes much louder than a body can fall. But when warmth ends in a burn, a rash, a scar, that is the day when Holika burns. And on this day, the streets filled with very brim with bursting color can figure a kaleidoscope. And that color swirls on ends of white cotton, staining eyelashes as they blink away midnight's ash. Every stare, seeing at dawn. This is the day when the world is in full swing of beauty. Apki sapulta ke lieb shub kamnai. And they do it for him. Spray showers of powder so that the vitality and green consumes whatever doubt he had in the Lord. Haul the yellow soothes and heals like the spring sunshine. And they do it for her. Blue, like our swinging ocean that separates us, like the color of Lord Krishna. O pomegranates, palm with red hibiscus flowers to purify the very soul. This joy comes back around when you least expect it, singing through the days when our souls are empty. And that's why they dance in the first place. And it couldn't bring any more warmth to my eyes, but that's when I saw him. His name, something I can't pull into a constellation, but it dances on the tip of my tongue. The red swallows me like a pill on God's tongue. Take me to remembrance. Apki sapluta ke liyev shub kamnai. I swear I've seen those eyes before. The eyes that stare fiery. A bite in the color black as the glass clicks in his direction. It clicks in my mind. As if this world's color palette can be taken on this day. And I want to see the world in its full color. And not this gray that humbles the way I exist in melancholy. Sapluta ke liyev shub kamnai. I wish you all I'm Olivia Howard and I'll be performing a monologue based on this piece by McCary known as Eloquence of the Eye, Woman at a Polling Booth. 
the female form. In Arab culture, women are viewed as subordinate. They are only indulgent mothers, sisters, and wives who perform household tasks. The female form. As times have changed, men and women now have rights to themselves, but women are still not equal to the man. As her female form is shrouded by her burqa, her eyes are the only thing shown. Her eyes say a thousand words, and they are witnessed by a thousand other eyes, and are stolen into this world that she must live in. Eloquence, fluent or persuasive, speaking or writing. How is she persuading us? What is she trying to say? Help me, save me, look at me and see what is happening to me. I wish I could help her. Maybe she can't be saved. Women during 1997 in Yemen were finally gaining a right to vote. Unfortunately, when this occurred, over 400 women had died from these events known as honor killings, which were the killings of young girls and women to cleanse their soiled honor. At the actual polling booth, no men were around to stop McCary from taking pictures. Almost 20 years have passed since this picture was taken, and there are still many miles to be traveled for women's rights in the Middle East. Let your mind think of a world you can never imagine. Let yourself listen without hearing. Let her unexpected beauty enter your eyes and show you something new. Hi, I'm Amelia, and I wrote a poem based on McCurry's piece, Children Playing on an Anti-Aircraft Gun. A bright blue sky contrasts the rusty orange sand divided by the broken buildings below the hill. Rising through the dust, a monster of a machine sits idle, but not completely alone. The children, trying to hide their pain, are entertained by this machine, this gun, this monster that was fired at enemy aircraft. Littered at the monster's feet lie the shells of forgotten toys, having been used once and chucked aside. With the ever-burning turmoil, the children are pained, yet there they are, continuing to play. Hello everyone, I am J.P. Galini, that's Darian Reynolds and Jackson Shoup. We are going to be doing a spoken word slash monologue on this piece right here. Uh, it's called Boys in the Boot of Attack. Look at these children. Centuries of pain packed into the back of a trunk like a spare tire. Are they okay? Are they safe? Where are they going? While we're worried what's for dinner, they're worried if there is dinner. While we're worried about when the new Nikes are dropping, they're worried about if they can make it to school without their shoes falling apart. Falling apart. Falling apart like the system of government that supposedly protects their religion and beliefs. Protected is a bad joke. It's a fable. It doesn't exist. It's like telling these kids they have the same chance as everyone else. Why should these children duck their heads in fear because of their beliefs? Because they believe in a different God than you. Kabul, Afghanistan, 1992. No, they are not safe. Safe. Safe like the idea of a government that treats them with integrity. So they pack their families into few cars and travel. Because that's the best, best thing they, they can, can do. do. Once again, I'm asked to climb into the trunk of my dad's 1956 Lotta. He doesn't tell me where we are going, and I don't ask. I, I feel like I never know what's going on anymore. I'm helpless. I'm told we're persecuted because of our religion, whatever that means. All I know is I'm treated differently. What's wrong with me? But here I am again in the back of this trunk. My dad screams for us to hold each other tightly, so we do. I clench my brother's hands as the wave of arms try to remove us from the safety of the trunk. I squeeze his knuckles until it turns white from the pressure. 
because the pressure my people face is suffocating me. Not this chunk I'm placed in. When you come to our town, the sign will say, Welcome, Welcome to Bambion. Come back to reality, and the sign really says, Welcome, Welcome to Misery. So I'll be performing an original poem based off the photo behind me uh, by Steve McCurry, portrait photographer. Capturing more than just faces, he preserves a moment in time. The moment before sons, husbands, and brothers head for battlefields filled with rockets that rain like the ashes they leave behind. The time when a boy converts into a man after 15 lunar years. His, timid, his timber image box per permits him to imprint souls on gloss before decades of despair and warfare. Mothers thank him for eternalizing their loved ones. Children cherish him for keeping the image of hope alive. Stills of stoic countenances line his walls, framed in perfect positions over his backdrop. Sitting, fulfilled with few, he waits for those who are ready to become deathless. Faced with another like him settles a smirk on his smile. Never before captured, never made perpetual. Igniting incarnations of mortals, snapshots into his lens, is his craft, his calling. So I'm going to be performing a piece that I wrote for Hindu Man Participates in the Holy Festival. The color frees the skin, for there is vitality in green. Shanti Raku Dhanama. Warmth comes from those around you, but bitterness can cloud your judgment. But here there is no judgment, for this is no place to assume that you can manufacture this feeling you hold inside. Free it, let it fly with the colors of your vitality. Take this in as if it were rain on your skin. Shanti Raku Doanamat. Be as free as the color on his skin and as loose as the flow of their dress. Shanti Raku Doanamat. Free yourself, and colors will run wild with the anticipation of palms and crystal skin kissed by the sun and a soul saved by the gods. Wings spread like that of a butterfly, thoughts crashing like waves on a sandy shore, but never stop growing like ivy of a wall. Do not hide yourself in all that you are. You are the gold leaf spread upon a plain, valuable like all the riches in the ground. Your heart is like the changing of the seasons, running with change and embracing it because it's part of you and all that you are. But it's not enough. The evil still holds on like a plague and spreads like a rumor in one ear and out the <coughs> other, like sand through your fingers, you slip and your faith to yourself goes elsewhere. You're lost, lost in this pit of emotions that do not define you. You're nobody but yourself. Do not let the evil in this world veer you away from who you are. Do not get lost in the ways of evil, no matter the beauty you see in that that is evil, it's not. Beauty is pure and captivates the white rays of heat on a cold day. Beauty is not evil. Beauty is a sunflower that blooms and still shines bright, brighter than a sun on a cloudy day that peeks through walls of dark skies. It palms in blue skies and wells with shallow waters. You are of purity in a cleansed soul. Find your purity. Your red that lifts you up like a bird taking his first flight because you may fall, but you will always fly. Green, red, black, vitality, purity, evil. These things do not define you. You define them. Let go, be free, for you, there is vitality in green. Hi, I'm Morgan Fernandez. I'm Mikhail Fitch, and we will be performing spoken word based on the Steve McCurry piece, uh, Wielder in a Shipbreaker Yard. 
Show me the adolescent groaning in frustration because his charger doesn't reach the bed. No, here you see a picture of a young man hoping that today will not be his last. Show me the picture of the adolescent faking a fever to enjoy a day off of school. No, here you see a picture of him hoping that the pain he feels is only temporary and that he can just get back to work. Show me the adolescent whose emotions are slipping and cracking between his fingers at the sight of homework. No, here you see a picture of him hoping that the crack he just heard was a ship breaking and not his friend's bones. Show me the adolescent who works just as hard as the boys in the shipbreaker yard, tearing apart wood like termites. Watching bodies be chucked in a pile like the spare part of a ship. When does a pile of wood become so comparable to a young boy? Why does a cracked phone screen seem just as fragile as the cracked bones of a shipbreaker? When is the beach no longer relaxing? When has the beach oh, become so, so different, different for the two worlds? Youthful bodies running to the shore, eager to feel the ocean breeze and sand between their toes. Will another boy on a different beach feel suffocation from the debris and lack of hope, feeling splinters of wood between his toes instead of sand? Wouldn't it be nice to finally feel the ocean calling him to freedom, crashing its waves past the wall of wood and uncertainty? Wouldn't it be nice for him to only worry about homework and not if he'll make it home alive tonight? Homework will not be the death of you. Homework will not leave you wondering if you will still be alive for another day. But a shipyard will take away your hope faster than a first world adolescent can take a selfie. Yeah. And I have done my own spoken word piece on the African continent. When we look at a person's face, what's the first thing that grabs our attention and pulls us in? The eyes. Take the eyes of the Afghan girl who stares us right in the face with those glossy, spherical organs, each having an iris with color filled up of a peaceful sea green wonder, and the black, piercing pupils that strikes and captivates the hearts and minds of anyone who beholds them. The eyes that haunt, and over time begin to taunt an expression that tells a story of anger and suffering from her experience, which is the cause of the weariness. A Soviet invasion that lasted 23 years in Afghanistan. Millions of people dead by bombing, like cockroaches being terminated by aerosol explosives. And millions more fleeing to the Nasrbal refugee camps in Pakistan allowing Mujahideen, the holy warriors, to guide them within their souls. The sheltered refugee homes, cramped and restless, having no privacy and living at the mercy of their own peers, a price paid for trying to evade the encroachment of their neighboring home. These are the eyes of Sharbat's Gula, Still speaking, after 17 years, refugee camps and the past behind her, appearances rough and aged, while the youthful eyes still gaze, the same expression that strikes and captivates the hearts and minds of anyone who beholds them. Hi, my name is Julia Parham, and I'll be performing a poem based off the image Monk, taken by Steve McCurry. <clears throat> Monk, he down to Joe Kong. Sacred spirits send old men to tombs. Tibetan tradition, two brides for one temple. He translates hieroglyphics with the wrinkles on his cheeks. Sitting on her heart in the house of the Buddha, her evil aura, his pillowcase. Tibet, living and breathing, but leading a life for Chinese to bleed, dry like Timbuktu. China craves control, but monk he down to the Kong. And here, on the heart
heart of Tibet, he finds himself in the house of the Buddha. He finds himself in Sinma. Hi, my name is Peyton Baumgartner, and today I will be doing a poem based off the image Girl with Green Shaw. Like forget-me-nots flowering in spring, the firstborn blue stems in her eyes. Those blue eyes were as if left from a wave after the foam has washed away. Silken strings of raven hair flowing beneath the green grass of the shaw, a true beauty. Her face as if hand carven by the very angels themselves, a red gown peekabooing from underneath the modest shade of the green shawl. Would she say, see me as a child, a child born without the burden of beauty? My next piece will be about the image young boy taken by Steve McCurry in Timbuktu. Home of fantasies, where mango trees are myths and rain showers feel like sandstorms. Dusting children like chores, young boys become ghostly. Water begins tasting like graveyards. Drought lasting 24 trips around the sun, and we're losing him to the relay. How can he rely on the 15,000 eyes staring back at him? <coughs> the rebel flag sitting on the spine of his swing set, sailing him southward, rolling rocks between his baby teeth. He buries them deep within the footsteps in the sand, quickly covered by hoof prints and young boys wearing it like war paint or white face, rather. Empty, like the Niger River. Dirty, like the decades before. All the way out in Timbuktu. We metaphor Mali. We fairy tale Tinabut Tut. Next, I'll be performing another poem from the image behind me, Woman at the Festival of the Horse. Weather, warm lit sunshine and lightly color kissed leaves. I'm ready to fall. I'm ready to be second handedly crushed and sorted with the soil beneath the changing trees. Horses parading in rings, coach to boast, performing without effort, commas professing ambitions to these young hairs. Women in memorable robes, painting roses upon their cheeks, just blooming from their winterborn skin. Tide bells, a jingle noise, riding the winds, passing around joy like an offering plate, all belonging to the hour of festival. My last piece will be about the image coal miner taken by Steve McCurry in Afghanistan. His eyes, stay speckled, freckled with gold. He holds hopes under his fingernails in his wrinkled brow, trying to evade the invasion. Sons with peppered hair and the same cracked spirit under crow's feet. His widow's peak hanging like a noose. Black lung being whitewashed by the warm wind of a light at the end of a tunnel. The cave and mine, his ash, stars to his night masked eyes, speckled with dust and fallen futures, freckled with gold, holding on to hope. May three generations of war remain religious rather than the background noise for his boys to curl up to in cave and wonders of mine, of coal. Hi, I'm JC Parker. And I'm Destiny Carney. And we will be performing monologues based on this photo, Mother and Child at Car Rando. I was looking back at the photos from my travels. 
when I came across a split-second photo of a mother and child who stood at my taxi window. Rain was trailing down their faces like tears. They peered at me, begging me for money. I wonder what they were thinking in that moment. What they thought of me when I rode away, leaving them behind, clothes soaked from the rain. It was monsoon season. And yet there they were standing, nothing to keep them warm, nothing to protect them from the tears of heaven that once fill its bombs. So many lives were lost in the destruction. How scared she must have been for her child's life for her own life. I wish I would have satisfied her begging, gave her something, anything. I wonder what they were thinking in that moment. I'm peering into your taxi window, gaining the courage to beg from you, a strange white man. You look me in the eyes so I know you can see me. You can see my child barefooted in old clothing. You give us no money. We have no coats to protect us from the rain, and the roads are beginning to flood. Soon, walking down the street will feel like swimming upstream, grabbing anything and everything to stay above the water. So please, step from your taxi, follow us to the market, buy us some food. Please be generous. Let the rupees fall from your hands like like the 13 bombs that fell from the skies. One. I wish I could have two, talked to you. Three. Learned your story. Four, I wish five, I could help ease your six, worries. Ease your seven, pain. Eight. I wish I could nine, give you food. Ten. Money. Anything eleven, you need. Twelve. I wish you would help my child. Thirteen. I wish I would have helped you both. But, but we are from two, two different worlds, worlds and it was seven. never meant to be. We're going to be performing a spoken word called Accepting Beauty, inspired by a portion of a boy, Sorry Tribe, and Sorry Tribe. Beauty comes in different forms, varying through different cultures and walks of life. People ignoring other cultures think it's uncivilized just because they see the world differently. But when will we be able to live in a world where we seek to find the beauty in the unexpected places? and expand our thoughts and expectations of the term beautiful. Training to be a warrior while still learning the ways of the world, fighting donga and scarring skin, marking another victory to show off like a new trophy with hope to inspire the future warriors to come. To become an example for those who have not yet experienced the ritual from becoming to gay to Laura. Beauty in every smile shared as the Surrey paint their skin with white and yellow and preparations for ceremonies. As we hide our true faces and alter our looks, they bring out the natural beauty in themselves. Assertive and independent, leaving the reliance of their mother to begin learning the working of the world. In every breath held, if we're cutting a new trophy into their skin, in every blink of every war struck eye, beauty resides in the ray of the sun. Kissing the land at the start of each day, and every smile shared with pride and honor for their tribe. With every sigh of every passing moment, beauty, as we use the cosmetic products tested on the animals that the Surrey tribe respects and protects as they worship the sky and the God who resides there. Tuma, protector of the living and keeper of child laughter, releasing beauty into the world below, and the raindrops that give life to crops and water to the cattle be kissed by the rain and the sun, widening our eyes to accept the beauty in every breath, every smile, every laugh. Beauty comes in moments. It's up to us to catch it by its tail, for it will come and go. Thank you. My name is Colson Berlin, and I'm going to be doing a monologue from the point of view as a firefighter on 9-11 about this piece. Work crews begin to clear wreckage from the collapse of the Twin Towers. The devil found New York City that day, the day that significantly changed everyone's lives forever. I know it did mine. I remember that day as clear as glass in a window. I was sitting, reading the paper, and suddenly I heard the most devastating crash I had ever heard before. I walked outside. I was concerned, not scared. I looked left. 
then right, then up. That's when the fear hit. It consumed me like a giant tsunami filling up the whole city. I ran back inside the fire station and within seconds the alarm went off. I pulled on my suit and ran outside with my best friend, Ryan, who was the second head chief fireman, right by my side. I, white papers. I remember white papers flying everywhere like a snowstorm. I looked at my watch, 9.03. Suddenly I heard Ryan whisper, oh God. And then all I heard was shattering glass, falling metal, and screams, which were all drowned out by the sound of a roaring plane. Another disaster had happened. I was frozen, frozen in time. I couldn't believe my eyes for the first time. I could see pain, I could see death. I was crying and I didn't even know it. Suddenly, I was back, back with the world. I could hear again, I could move again. And then this woman, I could hear her screaming right next to me, shut up. Shut up, please just shut up. And at all, I didn't even realize at that moment that I was screaming too. Everyone was. I knew I had to do something other than just stand here. I ran to the fire truck and got in. Silence hung in the air of the dark red truck. I had to break the suffocating silence that consumed us all. So, what do we do? I asked. And all the firemen in the truck looked at me as if I had just committed a crime. The, fire, the, the captain, who was driving, looked at the road, looked back at me, and looked at the road again. Try to live. His words gave me goosebumps all over. When we got to ground zero, the truck stopped. And we all sat there for a moment and let the fear consume us all once again. I remember the dust, the intoxicating dust that consumed us all, that consumed everything in sight. All right, let's get to work, Captain said. That was the last time I had ever, I would ever see him. That was the last time that I would ever hear him speak. I got out of the truck and walked slowly to the North Tower entrance. I stood for a moment, stood still for a moment, and then entered. It was empty, deserted, silent. And then all I heard was screams, someone yelling, it's coming down. And then all I saw was ash. I stood blind in the, in the suffocating ash for a moment, and then, the, and then a piece of metal the size of a car came barreling down at me. The pain, oh God, the pain. I laid flat, my arms crushed, my legs broken. I closed my eyes and saw a warm white light coming towards me. And then I was gone, gone from the world seduced into a coma for a year. When I woke up, I remember Tom, another fireman, coming to me and telling me that Ryan and the captain were both dead. I knew at that moment that the devil had found New York City that day. I decided to also do a poem uh, since I asked my students to, and it was uh, fantastic researching this image. I found out amazing things I had never known before. And that, for me, was the biggest educational boost of this project, was that my students would be able to study a part of the world that they had no clue about, including myself. I, too, was a student. So I chose this image, and it's to Hazara women mourn at a grave. The two gathered in blue, 
weeping at the tomb. The universal why, cratered by grief, the Persian tongue on the slab needs no translation. Sorrow travels transatlantic with heavy baggage. NATO turns a blind eye to the genocide, the universal why. Grief, the sucker punch. Grief, the almighty standstill. Grief, the body breaker, the mind stealer. Why do we love it all? If it hurts, life, the terrible beauty, death, the big brother of sleep. The two gathered in blue will soon be away. And two angels with solid black eyes, a shoulder span measured in miles, carrying two large hammers will appear and prop the deceased soul upright in his grave and ask three questions. What will he say? Thank you. Hello, I am Seth Loder, and I will be doing a poem on Stephen McCurry's piece, Bend I Near National Park. The Nature May Lake reflected the beauty of Afghanistan's first national park. Tourists were taking the sight of angelic landscape as a horse dust by them the rays of the sun suffuse the darkness in their hearts, bringing to mind better days, leaving them craving something new, something that will elicit their kaleidoscope minds, something that they possess in their instincts. And as a horse faded from view, so did their memories, so did their peace of mind. Hi, my name is Carson Gantz, and I will be performing an original monologue from the point of view of the geisha and the Take his set to this. Ten years ago, you got it to Kyoga, who she is. Be proud, be polite, be graceful, be strong, be beautiful. This is what the geisha must be. Simple, right? Yes. Wear a kimono to paint your face white and to smile. It is also simple to sing with perfect pitch, to dance without a trip, and to entertain at the snap of a finger. It is simple to eat without a drop, to drink without a spill, and to walk in platforms and never fall. Yes, all of this is simple, but a lifetime of training. Like walking up steps. Geisha must go through stages. From Shikomi to Minari to Michael to Gecko, the stages of Geisha are strenuous, painful, grueling, and simple. Simple it is your life. So, if you want to put on a floral robe, throw up your hair, cover up your face, and call yourself a Geisha girl, it's not that simple. Techie said to this, Ten is your coach. You got it to Kyoto ga utsukushi desu. 